My husband and I got married on February 9th of 2010, and to save us the double whammy to our wallets, we picked a weekend around that time to have a joint Valentine slash anniversary celebration together. These celebrations usually involve a simple staycation style holiday back when we were both on lower salary bands, but as the years went on and we got our finances in order, we started venturing further afield than just London or the home counties. Then, around Christmas of 2016, I was looking at potential Valentine's destinations when I suddenly found myself falling deep down the cottage core rabbit hole. Now back in the mid-2010s, it wasn't quite the same kind of cottage core aesthetic that emerged on social media during the pandemic. Like a lot of inspiration came from Japanese mori fashion, which emphasizes muted colors and nude shades like beige, brown, off-white, light green and earthy red, as well as natural materials like cotton, linen, wool, and leather. But anyway, after seeing a lot of posts outlining Mori styles and aesthetics, I suddenly got a bee under my bonnet about staying in a remote country cottage over Valentine's weekend. When my husband agreed, we started looking at a few places and eventually settled on a small, cozy-looking cottage up in North Yorkshire. We booked the place from Friday the 12th to Sunday the 14th, with plans to drive back home on the Monday morning, and by early February, I was beginning to get really excited about the whole thing. Work had been hellish, the weather had been crap, and not one but two of our appliances were on the brink, so I really needed a little getaway by the time Valentine's Day loomed on the horizon. On the day itself, we got the earliest train possible up to York, then took a taxi out to the cottage. It turned out to be everything we could have possibly hoped for. A lot of Airbnb really try and do you over with the angles of pictures and all that, but all the fixtures and fittings were of the utmost quality. Me and my husband had a bath together in the giant tub that had been fitted upstairs, then after wandering into a nearby village, we got some pub food, had a couple of pints, then went back to the cottage to get some sleep. The next morning was just blissful. We had nothing planned, no work commitments to worry about. It was just me, him, and a weekend of coziness to look forward to. I made us some bacon and eggs, then after a long, steamy shower together, we sprawled ourselves on the living room settee and just relaxed. We had our phones switched off. Almost no one knew where we were, and the cottage was basically smack bang in the middle of nowhere, which made it all the more surprising when, at some point in the early afternoon, we heard a knock at the front door. It actually spooked us a little bit at first, hearing three piercing bangs out of absolutely nowhere. But regardless, we knew we had to answer it, as it might have been the host trying to get some important info to us. After all, we've had our phones switched off all morning, so up we get, making sure to fasten our dressing gowns nice and tight so we don't give the visitor a surprise peep show, then we open up the door. Standing in front of us was a man around my dad's age, so mid-50s to early 60s, and behind him up the driveway is a large, plain white van. He gives us a warm and friendly greeting, then tells us that the owners have hired him and his building firm to do a bit of emergency renovation work. That meant that we'd have to vacate the property for around two to three hours. As you can imagine, me and my husband were very bewildered about the situation. The Airbnb host hadn't mentioned anything about any renovation work, and there certainly didn't seem to be any sort of emergency inside. Everything looked fine. When we suggested that there must have been some kind of mistake, the bloke just shrugged like it wasn't his problem, told us a job's a job, then asked us what time we'd be okay vacating for a couple of hours. My husband rarely gets annoyed at things like that. He's a very patient person, but the idea of paying almost a grand to then have our holiday interrupted... I could tell that he was fuming about it. Fuming though he was, my husband asked the builder if he didn't mind waiting a few minutes because he wanted to give the host a call to clear a few things up. Suddenly, the builder's attitude changes completely, and instead of being all polite, he just said, Oi, in this really aggressive way, stopping my husband in his tracks as he was closing the front door. Then I swear to God, he says, I tried the easy way don't make me do things the hard way. Both me and my husband are like, you what? Both pretty offended as how rude he was being. Then as he starts prattling on about us leaving the cottage, 
my husband shouts something about calling the police before slamming the door in his face. We didn't call the police, not right away anyway. Instead, I grabbed my phone and got onto the host to see if the man's claims were genuine. It took a while to get them to call us back, but when they did, they denied having arranged any kind of building work. We then tried to clarify who the man was and why he'd been so threatening, but the host claimed to have no idea. They asked us to call the police if we didn't feel safe, and if we really didn't want to stay another night, we could leave with a full refund if we'd considered booking another time. The host and his wife were those two pensioners who supplemented their income through the rentals, and they were so sweet about the whole thing. So instead of us turning tail and running at the first sign of trouble, we decided to stay for the duration of our booking and enjoy the holiday we'd worked so hard to afford. Whatever the weird bloke's game was, we were pretty confident that the threat of calling the police would dissuade him from whatever he had in mind. And if it didn't, well, we'd just cross that bridge when we came to it. If we'd have known what was about to happen, if the bloke had given us any clue whatsoever, we'd have been out of there within the hour. But he didn't. When he turned nasty, it was all these cryptic antagonistic warnings and threats that were only ever going to provoke a defensive response. We had no idea what he had in mind, so we stayed, and a couple of hours later, it all started to go downhill. It's early evening, so about 6 o'clock, and because of the time of year, it's almost completely dark outside. Obviously, we were still quite concerned by the strange bloke's bizarre visit, but after my husband found an old cricket bat in his upstairs cupboard, we felt marginally safer. On top of that, hours had gone by and we'd seen hide nor hair of our unwelcome visitor, so we just crossed our fingers that we'd see no more of him and got on with our romantic weekend getaway. We weren't feeling particularly hungry, and the pub served food until 8, so we decided on a quick dip in the giant bath before beginning the walk into the village. The upstairs layout was such that the bathroom was on the front side of the cottage, with the bedroom at the rear. The bedroom had this cute pair of wooden framed windows that opened outward into the back garden, but the bathroom had only one small circular window that opened just a crack. If you looked out, you could see the cottage's driveway along with a little bit of the lane outside, so when we were in the bath and we thought that we heard a noise coming from outside, my husband climbed out of the tub and peered through the glass onto the driveway. Like I might have already mentioned, my husband is the most emotive person, definitely the counterweight to me being very fiery, but that's another story. You hardly ever see him angry, and you never see him scared. So when he turned around to me, and I saw this look of blind terror on his face, I knew that we were in a hell of a lot of trouble. Get out of the bathroom, put some clothes on, was all he said after that, and he ran to the bedroom to do so himself. You can imagine how panicked I am, because he still hadn't told me what he'd seen that had got him so frightened. It was the bloody zombie apocalypse for all I knew, so while I too rush to put some clothes on, I'm asking him over and over again what's going on. Please just tell me what's happening. There are people outside. They've got masks on. We need to hide. I knew it was connected to the guy who'd visited us in the early afternoon. I just bloody knew it. I just hadn't the foggiest idea how. I made sure to throw on as many layers as I could, knowing that we'd probably end up running out the back door or something if the blokes outside tried coming through the front. Then bang. What turned out to be a sledgehammer smashed into the front door and we take that as our cue to get the hell out of there. We ran downstairs, actually saw the damage that was done to the door by whoever was breaking it down, then bolted towards the kitchen, which is where the back doors were. It was very scary, but I remember knowing that whatever the man or men wanted, it involved the cottage, not us. If we just ran off and stayed away for a few hours, everything would be fine, right? Wrong. My husband swung open the back doors after struggling to unlock them, but instead of being greeted by the path to freedom, we were greeted by a man in a balaclava with a massive crowbar-looking thing in his hands. We were trapped. The man with the crowbar thing ordered us back into the house, and he was soon joined by another masked man carrying what looked an awful lot like a big saw. One of them told my husband, If you do anything stupid, 
will kill your missus. And that kept him fairly quiet. Me, on the other hand, I was just so scared, so I kept saying all sorts of things begging them not to hurt us, that we were sorry, that we'd just leave if they let us go free. All they replied with was, shut up, shut your mouth. And then the next thing I know, we're being led into one of the upstairs rooms and made to kneel. I was so scared that they were going to kill us. All that assurance that they were there to rob the house or something just completely went out the window. And in the end, I had to make so much noise that they shoved a pillowcase in my mouth to keep me quiet. The next thing I remember, the intruders made my husband tell them where our phones were. And that gave me more hope that they weren't going to hurt us. They didn't seem like petty thieves, so taking our phones was to ensure us that we wouldn't be able to phone the police once they left, I was thinking. I only really started to calm down and compose myself when I heard some really loud banging from downstairs, and my husband started reminding me that they weren't there for us, that they were just looking for something, and if all the hammering was anything to go by, it was something in the walls. Since we were told to keep completely quiet, we could hear all the smashing and bashing downstairs, and we could hear the guys saying things to each other. You could hear, try this one here, and then bang. Someone would smash a sledgehammer into a wall. Then you'd hear others ripping the wood and plaster apart, no doubt looking for something. They did this over and over again until finally, you heard someone downstairs shout, got it. I couldn't see what was going on, but you could tell that they'd found what they were looking for because there was this big flurry of activity before the guy guarding us suddenly leaned in and growled something to us. I don't want to hear an effing peep out of the two of you until we're gone. You try anything, and we'll kill both of you. After that, he was gone, and after a little bit more activity from downstairs, the cottage was silent again. Neither of us moved for what felt like a very long time. Even though it felt like we were in the clear, I couldn't stop shaking. In fact, I think I was shaking harder then than I was when they were tying our hands, blindfolding and gagging us. And that was just all raw fear. What came next was this emotionally exhaustive adrenaline come down. When we finally thought it was safe, my husband somehow wriggled his way out of his bindings, then untied mine as he tried to reassure me. I just burst into tears as he hugged me, having never felt so grateful to be alive in my whole life. It felt like we'd lived through a nightmare come to life, it was surreal in the extreme, and once we collected ourselves, we began to creep downstairs to survey the damage. The cottage was completely empty apart from us, but we crept downstairs nonetheless, taking in a stare at a time in total silence, terrified that a masked man would suddenly reappear in what remained of the front door frame. Thankfully, no one came back, and as we edged our way into the front room, our jaws dropped to the extent of the damage. They'd taken a sledgehammer, along with a saw and God knows what else, and they'd torn up all the walls in both the front and back rooms of the cottage. It was a total mess, but through all the torn up wallpapers and layers of settled plaster dust, a sort of pattern started to emerge. Most sections of wall bore a few sledgehammer strikes, but only one section was completely torn out. Just like we'd heard them, they'd been probing sections of the wall before they found whatever they were looking for. Then they'd torn out that whole section to retrieve it. We had a good look inside the hole they'd made, but there was no trace of whatever had been hidden there. They'd also smashed the landline phone, so there was no contacting anyone without walking into the nearby village to get some help. So that's what we did. We set up camp in the corner of the local pub, and after hearing what happened to us... The locals were basically lining up to buy us pints and offer their condolences. This was great for me as I definitely needed something to calm my nerves, but not so much for my husband, who was our designated driver back to London a few hours later. We had some dinner, they made calls to the police, the Airbnb host, and our loved ones back home, each explaining the situation and what we planned on doing next. After that, we waited around the pub to give a statement to one of the local coppers whose colleagues had driven over to the cottage to cordon off their crime scene. We told him what we knew, swapped contact details, then got started on the drive back to London. 
we were still very shaken up, and if they hadn't bashed the door down in bloody February, we'd have probably just stayed the final night. So all we were interested in when we got home were hot showers and early nights. But then the following morning, the theory started. Over breakfast, we started to talk about how bad we felt for the owner. Granted, what we went through was extremely grim, but we weren't hurt and they'd stolen nothing but our phones, which were both insured, thankfully. On the other hand, our sweet retiree hosts had their pension investments smashed up, all after sinking thousands into renovating it. But then, what had the masked men taken, and who did it belong to? It was obviously so important and possibly so illegal that they felt the need to tie us up, blindfold us, and deny us any means of contacting the police so they were safe to retrieve it. But after that, all we had was unanswered questions and increasingly wild ones at that. I'd like to tell you that we found out, or even that we came up with some kind of solid theory, but the God's honest truth is that we're flummoxed, and apparently so are the police. To our knowledge, the owners hadn't reported anything stolen, and even with the security camera footage which showed the group of men arriving, they just didn't have enough to go on to make any arrests. The rest of the story is a bit boring and involves refunds, insurance claims, and a lot of retelling the whole event to friends and relatives. It was horrible, but like I've said, neither of us are particularly traumatized and we both firmly put it all behind us. But sometimes, just sometimes, I'd give my left arm to know what had been hidden in that bloody wall. A few years ago, I took my grandma and her friend on holiday to Egypt. There were some really cheap packages for this resort town called Sharm El Sheikh, and they'd both been really poorly and due to the cold weather over the winter, so I decided to do a good deed and pay for us all to get some sun for the week. Anyway, I booked the flights for February the 9th and we flew out from Heathrow in the morning. The heat was just what they needed and it was great getting to spend some quality time with them both. But after a couple of days, I started to get a touch of cabin fever. Like I said, my gran and her pal were content to spend the whole time by the pool, gabbing away and drinking non-alcoholic cocktails. Whereas me, on the other hand, I wanted to actually see a bit of the country that I came so far to visit. I wanted to soak up a bit of the culture, try some real authentic food instead of the O2 familiar European style grub they'd served at the resort. I also wanted to mix with the locals and... As the calendar drew closer to Valentine's Day, I found myself longing for a different kind of company. Now's the time where I have to clear something up. I'm a gay man, I was still in my 30s at the time, and I was also very much available. I'm also not one for the holiday romances or one night stands, so at first, I didn't even think about dipping my toe into the local dating pool. But as I said, around Valentine's Day I found myself playing the hopeless romantic, and wondering if there was anyone I could share a bit of romance with at such a special time of year. It sounds sappy, I know, but I'm prone to a bit of sappiness, so you'll have to forgive me. Anyway, since Egypt isn't exactly known for its acceptance of gay or lesbian lifestyles, I didn't reckon that there'd be any bars that I could pop into for a bit of harmless flirting. So instead, I decided to see who in the area was on Tinder. I brought up the app, changed my location and did a bit of swiping here and there throughout the day. There were a few tourists and only a handful of locals were brave enough to actually show their faces but one did and oh my days was he gorgeous. He was tall, dark and handsome, every queen's dream and his bio said that he worked as a resort manager. His English seemed really good from his profile so I thought that I'd swipe right and see what came of it. I really didn't think that we'd match. He seemed way out of my league, so I just sort of resigned myself to it not happening and started planning a little trip into the old town so I could check out some of the old mosques and stuff. I jump a resort shuttle into the old town, have a little wander around the market and all that, and I'm taking pictures of all sorts of amazing things as I go. Then, on the way back towards the shuttle shop, I walk past somewhere with free Wi-Fi and since I had all my data off to save a few quid on the phone bill, 
I took the opportunity to log on to the Wi-Fi so I could send Grant a few photos as if to say, look what you're missing out on. Then right as I'm trying to send a photo, a Tinder match comes through and it's the Egyptian Adonis that I had mentioned before. I couldn't believe it. I was just staring at the match in disbelief, thinking that this must be my lucky day. Then as I'm looking at the screen, he starts typing a hello. This was it. We talked for about half an hour back and forth as I walked up and down the streets just beaming to myself. When I told him that I was only there for a few more days, he asked if I wanted to meet that night. If I give him a few hours to get home from work and take a shower, I could be around by 7pm for dinner and a movie. He asked if I like pasta, and oh my god do I like pasta, and then when I said yes, he said that he'd make me some fresh and homemade. I was ready to fall in love right there, and after telling him that I'd give him a text in a few hours, I headed back to the resort. Gran knew something was up, she could tell by how much that I was smiling when I got back. She was a bit slower to accept me coming out than my parents were, but she got there in the end, and by that time she was very supportive. So when she recognized a bit of glow about me, she had no qualms about asking me 101 questions while she and her friend giggled back and forth like schoolgirls. I told her that I'd be having dinner with a friend and that if all went well, that I'd be back in the morning. When they'd finished giggling, Gran and her friend got awful sweet about the whole thing, wished me luck and told me to have a lovely time. The man I'd been texting, we'll just call him Mal, had given me the address of his flat near the old town. He said he couldn't offer me any wine, but that the pasta sauce was on the stove and he was very excited to see me. I was excited to see him too. Really excited, actually. Too excited to consider if maybe it wasn't such a good idea after all. But I didn't think. Or if I did, it was only from my little naive bubble where I couldn't possibly consider the outcome of such a thing. I wanted to meet Maul so much that... It didn't even occur to me that he didn't exist in the first place. Things only started to seem off when I was actually walking up to his flat, when I saw what a state of disrepair the building was in. It wasn't exactly a wreck or anything, but all of Maul's pictures had made him look quite well off. That block of flats didn't seem like the kind of place a person like that would call home, but just the thought made me feel like I was being way too judgmental. The one moment of doubt I had, the one opportunity I really had to walk away and save myself, I just brushed off the idea like it was nothing. I followed my heart when I should have trusted my gut, and I ended up paying dearly for it. I found the apartment matching the number he'd given me and knocked on the door. There was a complete silence on the other side. Maybe it's a bit too hopeful of me to expect the sounds of smooth jazz and cooking when I arrive at the home of a potential date. But complete silence, hearing nothing, gave me the creeps immediately. Then, when someone answered the door, it was a total stranger. Not Maul, not even anyone who looked like him. It was just this chubby, bearded bloke who somehow knew my name. It was so confusing that I didn't even know what to say at first. I was scared that I'd been catfished or something. But then, the guy addresses me by name, then invites me inside saying he's a friend of Maul's and that he'll be back in a few minutes. I'm still very hesitant to walk into his flat, and I'm still thinking of something's really off here, but then the guy suddenly said something that put my mind at ease. His English was good, but heavily accented, and he said something like, Don't worry, I know you and Maul have a meeting together. I'll be leaving when he comes back, I promise. He sounded as warm and welcoming as possible, and like I said, I actually found it quite reassuring at first. But the thing is, I might be an idiot, but I'm not a total idiot, so instead of going inside, I decided to politely decline. I told the guy that it'd be more comfortable waiting outside and that I'd give him all a call or something to see where he was. I thanked the guy, gave him a wave, and turned to walk back down the stairs, but I already knew it was too late. The look the guy gave me when I turned him down was chilling. He went from happy and smiley to completely expressionless in like a microsecond, and part of me knew right then that things were about to go horribly wrong. As I got about halfway down the stairs, I heard shouting coming from above me. It was a man's voice, and he sounded very angry. I thought it was the man that I had been talking to 
who was now fuming that his catfish had been rumbled, and out of fear that he'd started chasing me down the stairs a la Patrick Bateman, I started basically running down the stairs to get out of there faster. I hadn't even got to the bottom yet when I realized that yes, the man was actually giving chase, but when I got onto the street outside, there were two police officers standing right in front of me, like my guardian angels had suddenly materialized right when I needed them most. I started to explain what was happening in the plainest, simplest English possible, hoping they'd be able to understand, but as I spoke, I suddenly realized that they were not there to help me. They were both giving me these absolute death stares, and I remember shouting, wait, 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 as one of them pulled out this big wooden baton. After that, my memory gets a bit patchy. I know they took me back up into the flat that I just walked away from, but honestly, I couldn't tell you if I walked or if they carried me. The next solid memory I have was being punched and kicked while the man who answered the door asked me questions in English. I remember trying to answer them as best as I could at first, but I could taste blood in my mouth, and anything I tried to say just came out as a kind of groan. I spit out the blood so I could speak, but that just made them beat me harder. Then the questions turned to my sexuality and the reasons I had traveled into the old town that evening. In that moment, it wasn't quite like their whole scheme came together before my eyes, but it definitely was a big clue for me. The invite from Maul had obviously been some kind of trick, and although I was sadly familiar with the concept of gay bashing back in the UK, the fact that the police were involved in whatever was going on was absolutely terrifying to me. It's a testament to how scared I was that when they actually put some handcuffs on me and dragged me out to a waiting police car, I was actually relieved. I thought that that'd be the end of the beatings and abuse, and the beginnings of some kind of official legal process, but it was only half right. They took any opportunity they could to punch me, kick me, or throw me into a wall, and when I asked what I was being charged with, they told me simply, debauchery. I didn't even know what debauchery even was at the time let alone that there was a law against it in Egypt, and the fact I was completely in the dark about the whole thing meant my nerves were stretched to a breaking point for almost every minute that I was in that cell. I only really got an idea of what was going on when a man from the British Foreign Office turned up to have a chat with me. I never thought that I'd be so happy to see another English person, and at first, just being spoken to like a bloody human being was such a relief that I had to fight back tears for a while. His name was Martin, and as much as first meeting him was a real boost, the news he had for me wasn't good. Basically, Egypt had made it illegal to be intimate with someone outside of marriage. They call this law Article 9 or something. Officially, its purpose is to combat what they call adultery, but unofficially, it's the law that makes being gay a crime in the country, and if you're charged with an Article 9 related crime, a conviction can mean anything from six months to three years in prison. Just hearing the words three years in prison made me feel physically sick, and I think I was just about on the verge of a panic attack before Martin managed to calm me down. He told me not to worry, and that the foreign office was leveraging the Egyptian government on my behalf. However, they needed something from me, too. They needed me to remain almost completely silent. I was to say nothing about my sexuality and if they asked me any other questions, my only answers were to be, I don't recall, or my intentions were purely platonic. I was to repeat these two phrases until I was blue in the face, and if I kept shtum, the police would eventually have no choice but to drop the charges. Martin talked like it was something he'd been through a hundred times, and that reassured me that everything would be okay, but also kept saying over and over again before he left, don't say a bloody thing. All this hinges on your silence. And he was right. But my god, did the Egyptian police use some dirty tricks to try and get a confession out of me. During the final period of questioning before they let me go, they told me things like, If you tell us you're gay and admit what you tried to do, we'll let you go. They tried acting so genuine, and it was sickening seeing how nice they could act, when all they wanted to do was put me in prison and slap me with a steep fine. I just did what Martin had asked me and in the end, they let me go. 
I'd rather not rehash the reunion with my nan. Let's just say it was very emotional, with a lot of tears and a lot of apologies. I spoke to Martin briefly on the phone before we were due to fly home, and he assured me that no further charges would be filed. I thanked him for helping me, and he assured me that he was only doing his job, no different from all the other suits and ties that keep the wheels of government turning. But to me, he was so much more than that. To me, the man who appeared so calm and collected while I was at my breaking point, he was my hero. Even if he was the most unassuming hero you could dream of. At around 6 p.m. on Valentine's Day of 2007, 23-year-old French-Canadian Philippe Lejoie sat down for dinner in a small hometown of saint Didas, Quebec. Once he'd finished, he put on his boots, grabbed his car keys, then made the short drive over to a town called Yamashish. It was here that Philippe owned and operated a small pigsty with the assistance of his older brother, Matteo. He normally joined Philippe in tending to the pigs, but on that particular day, a heavy snowstorm meant Mathieu was occupied with snowplowing duties. In light of that, Philippe asked their father if he cared to join him in place of his brother, yet his father declined on account of the bitterly cold weather. It was a decision that he'd come to gravely regret. Philippe was expected to return home at around 9 to 9.30 p.m., as his poor sign duties only took around two to three hours. But by two o'clock in the morning, when Philippe had still yet to return home, his mother began frantically calling the pigsty in order to check in on him. When he failed to pick up the phone, Philippe's father and brother drove out to the Yamashish pigsty to search for him. When they arrived, the two men found Philippe's truck empty, with the rear door wide open and the key still in the ignition. It appeared as if the truck had been in that condition for quite some time, as snow was starting to gather on the lip of the interior. When they checked the truck's engine and ignition, it appeared as if the truck had been left in that condition for quite some time, as the snow started to gather on the lip of the interior. When they checked the truck's engine and ignition, it appeared to be in full working order, and a bag containing Philippe's work clothes was lying in the back seat. The men discovered that the clothes had fresh muck on them and that the pigs had been fed, meaning Philippe had vanished some time after completing his duties. They called out his name, hoping that he might have been close, but they were greeted only by the squealing and snuffling of their pigs. It was as if Philippe had simply vanished into thin air. Matthew and the boy's father arrived back in St. Dadas at around 6 a.m., and checking a nearby hospital, contacted law enforcement to report Philippe missing. Quebec police launched a massive search effort in the days that followed, one that included specialist tracker dogs, helicopter-borne search teams, and legions of local and regional volunteers. Their efforts were initially promising, but just days into the search, a huge snowstorm blanketed the area with almost three meters of thick snow. Volunteers worked as best they could, using sticks and batons to probe the snowdrifts, but frustratingly, not a single trace of Philippe was ever recovered, and search was abandoned on February 23rd. In the aftermath of the disastrous search effort, police began to theorize that Philippe had either traveled elsewhere to take his own life, or had carried out a voluntary disappearance in order to begin a new life somewhere else. His family swiftly dismissed the idea of him taking his own life, and a provincial inquiry agreed that it was extremely unlikely given the lack of note or remains. It was also declared improbable that Philippe had absconded for some reason, as all of his personal effects remained at home and his bank account had remained untouched in the time since he disappeared. But then, around three weeks after Philippe vanished, police raised the possibility of something very disturbing having occurred. One day, Matthew received a phone call from one of the detectives charged with finding his brother. The detective asked if he'd noticed anything unusual about his pig's manure. Matthew replied in the negative, then suddenly realized what the detective was implying. Matthew had been disposing of the pig's feces for weeks by that point, and at no point had anyone bothered to analyze them for any trace of Philippe's remains. Forensic examiners rushed to gather all of the pig's droppings that they could get their hands on, 
but once again, they found nothing. Yet this was weeks after Philippe had disappeared, and although it was still feasible that remnants of his corpse might still be in the digestive tracts, we can't roll out the horrifying possibility that Philippe was eaten by his own pigs. At five foot eight and around 150 pounds, Philippe wasn't a huge man by any stretch of the imagination, and pigs had been known to chew through flesh and bone until even the largest of corpses had been completely consumed. Yet even if that was the case, Surely, Matthew would have noticed a scrap of denim or an errant bootlace amongst the pig's scat. Maybe so, but if he wasn't actually looking, then maybe not. After all, the idea that Philippe had been devoured was a thought too horrible to possibly contemplate, at least until a detective suggested it as a possibility. It should be noted that the chances of Philippe passing out in the pig pen only to be fully consumed over the course of five hours is extremely low. According to Quebec police, it's not a theory they're taking particularly seriously, but at the same time, it's not one that they can entirely roll out either. On the fifth anniversary of Philippe's disappearance, his father drove over to the provincial courthouse to have his son declared legally deceased. His father had been staunchly reluctant to do so and had prayed that one day Philippe would return home, but increasing financial pressures forced his hand, and having Philippe declared dead in absentia was the only way to access his bank account and insurance policies. Or perhaps his apparent hope was more like denial. Denial that something so horrendous might have happened to his beloved son. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. On February 12th of 2015, the Halifax Department of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police received a phone call from a terrified member of the public. They claimed that a group of three were planning on committing mass murder at the Halifax Shopping Centre, a place where over 160 stores are patronized by tens of thousands of daily shoppers. The intended date of the attack was February 14th, Valentine's Day, and a Saturday to boot. The shopping center would be teeming with throngs of shoppers, no doubt including dozens of happy couples, old and new. The anonymous tipster named two of the group by name. 20-year-old Randall Stephen Shepard and a 23-year-old American girl by the name of Lindsay Suvanarat, both were said to be heavily armed and extremely violent. The RCMP quickly traced the couple's movements to the home of 19-year-old James Rushton Gamble, and in the early hours of Friday, February 13th, officers surrounded Gamble's home and prepared to strike. When Gamble's parents departed the house to run Saturday morning errands, they had barely gotten to the end of the street before their car was ambushed by heavily armed officers. They were dragged from their vehicle, handcuffed, then led into a large command and control vehicle where a round of intense questioning began. Detectives offered the couple no clue as to why they were detained, but the reason soon became obvious. Every question put to them by the officers involved their son. They were asked if their son was home, if he was alone, if he talked of his plans for the day, and if he owned any firearms. Gamble's parents could only offer patchy responses, at least until it came to the last question. Yes, James owned a firearm, but had recently come into possession of two more, a large caliber lever action rifle and a 16 gauge shotgun. Officers at the scene believed that these were the firearms the group planned to use in their attack on the Halifax Shopping Center, and although securing them was undoubtedly a victory, it presented them with another problem. Raiding the home could trigger a drawn-out and bloody firefight with the three murderous fanatics. If the RCMP SWAT teams were going to strike, they had to be swift, and it had to be decisive. Within the hour, the commander of the Mounties SWAT team gave word that his men were ready to go, and when the signal was given, they stormed the Gamble residence with calculated ferocity. They cleared each room with the precision and timing of a well-oiled machine until finally, only one locked door remained. The officers stacked up, kicked away the thin wood paneling, and surged into the room to confront their suspects. While some expected to be greeted with a torrent of gunfire, the interior of James' bedroom was still and silent, but it was not empty. Lying on his bed, 
having blown his brains out with a self-inflicted gunshot wound, was James Rushton Gamble, but his accomplices were nowhere to be found. At first, the discovery terrified local law enforcement, who couldn't work out how Gamble had been alerted to their presence. At no point had the officers heard any gunshots after breaching and entering the home, and despite having traced Shepard and Suvanna Rath to the residence, they were nowhere to be found. Officers began to speculate that the group had somehow been tipped off and were so alert to the risk of a police interdiction that they'd spotted the encroaching SWAT team and acted accordingly. Yet before local law enforcement descended into a panic over the fact that two potential mass murderers had slipped through their fingers, the situation suddenly became clear. The anonymous tip had come from James Gamble himself, who had denied his accomplices access to their firearms before taking his own life. The arguably heroic decision had denied Shepard and Savannah Roth their primary weapons, and with their names, descriptions, and likenesses clogging up emergency news broadcasts all over the region, it was only a matter of time before they were located and apprehended. But regardless, until they were in police custody, Shepard and Savannah Roth remained a clear and present danger to the Canadian public. Meanwhile, over at Halifax Stanfield International Airport, a young man with dirty blonde hair and a black leather jacket was sitting in the arrivals lounge. He was waiting for a friend who arrived on a flight from O'Hare International Chicago's premier commercial travel hub. They'd been communicating online for almost a year by that point, chatting, sharing, and plotting. When this friend arrived at Canadian immigration, the policy of pre-clearance between the US and Canada meant that she could pass through with just a brief check of her passport. But when an immigration official noticed that the girl had very little in the way of luggage or cash in her possession, he started to become suspicious. The official asked to see the girl's passport once more, and when he checked the name, he saw it read, Lindsay Suvanna Rath. Lindsay watched as the official typed away at his computer terminal, then suddenly, he turned pale. Seconds later, a stern-looking member of airport security arrived and asked Lindsay to accompany her to a nearby interview room. When asked why she was visiting Canada, Lindsay replied that she was visiting her boyfriend, James Gamble, and how the couple had planned to spend Valentine's weekend together. The answer didn't seem to satisfy the security official, who asked Lindsay to clarify exactly what they planned to do. Lindsay replied something to the effect of, What does any couple do on Valentine's Day? It was a good enough cover story, but following a brief search of her backpack, Lindsay had a great deal of difficulty explaining why one of her hats bore a swastika symbol. After that, Lindsay refused to answer any more questions, at which point she was arrested on charges of issuing threats. The couple remained tight-lipped during questioning, and any initial attempts to get them to talk were unsuccessful, but as one team of police officers struggled to make a breakthrough, Another group came across an information gold mine in the form of Shepard and Suvanna Rath's Tumblr blogs. It became clear that all three plotters had met on the website and had become friends after discovering mutual interests in horror movies, heavy metal, and extreme far-right politics. The trio seemed to idolize the perpetuators of the Columbine High School Massacre, with Suvanna Rath christening her blog School Shooter Chic, Violence is an Aesthetic. The pastel pink color scheme of her blog page stood in sharp contrast to its content, which included cartoon images of violent paraphilia. Lindsay also seemed to venerate white supremacist politics, which is extremely ironic given her Southeast Asian heritage. Yet although her politics were quite evidently confused, her intentions were not. Just over a week before she landed in Canada, Savannah Rath had posted a picture on Tumblr, one with a caption stating, Valentine's Day, it's going down. She most definitely intended to wreak havoc on the innocent citizens of Halifax that day, and if it wasn't for the courage of the anonymous tipster and the swift actions of Canadian law enforcement, many people would have lost their lives that day. By all accounts, it was Randall Shepard who cracked first, and although it's not clear what variety of interrogative techniques were used, he ended up telling the police everything. James Gamble and Lindsay Savannah Rath had been the attack's primary planners, while Shepard had taken on the role of cheerleader as he phrased it. 
All three had planned to shoot up the Halifax shopping center before taking their own lives, with the whole thing taking on an air of twisted romance for James and Lindsay. With the Shepherd's confession secured, both he and Lindsay were charged with conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to commit arson, illegal possession of weapons for dangerous purposes against the public, and making threats over social media. Neither sought bail when they later appeared in court, with Lindsay refusing to display an ounce of remorse. At his trial in November of the following year, Randall Shepard pled guilty on the charge of conspiracy to commit murder and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. His sentence would have been much higher if it wasn't for his cooperation during questioning, but while Randall had displayed a degree of remorse following his arrest, Lindsay Savannarath remained unflinching in the face of justice. Not a word passed her lips during any of the police interviews. All she did was stare a hole into whoever was talking to her, including the judge who presided over her trial. In light of this, he declared her an ongoing threat to society and sentenced her to life in prison with a minimum of 10 years served before she was eligible for parole. Lindsay's legal team were outraged by the seemingly harsh sentence and appealed it almost immediately. However, Canadian legal scholars judged that she had ample time to express remorse, and having neglected to do so at every turn, her appeal was denied. One of the pieces of evidence referenced in the denial of Lindsay's appeal was a long-form manifesto that she hoped to have published following the Halifax Massacre. One line reads, It has always been my greatest dream to die in battle, but I do so not as a soldier, but as a murderer. The passage it's included in also seems to refer to German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche when it says, My hate is beyond good and evil. In one section, Lindsay refers to her desire for violence as her heroic longings and says she fights for principles, not politicians. What morality is depends on which end of the gun you are looking at. With a gun in your hand, I am God. Yet while much of Lindsay's manifesto has the capacity to terrify, much of it is saturated with a deep melancholy. In all my 23 years of life, I have never learned to love another person, one passage reads. I receive love, but it passes through me like water through a sieve. She also wrote of the wonders of isolation and how she wished to be free from empathy. Following her transfer to the Central Nova Scotia Correctional Facility, Lindsay was forbidden from keeping any kind of formal diary, so instead, she used just about anything she could to record her thoughts. At one point, a prison guard found a note scrawled on the back of a Sudoku puzzle. It is a strange feeling to meet someone and almost immediately know that you ought to die with them, Lindsay wrote. To James and I, it happened simultaneously. At first, we were casual acquaintances, having discovered each other's Tumblr blogs through a mutual interest in the Columbine shooting and in national socialism communities. Less than a month later, we were planning our deaths. These days, the girl who once created a fictional persona she named the Nightmare Nazi shows little remorse for blood that she intended to spill that Valentine's Day. She also refuses to accept that James Gamble was the one who made the anonymous phone call which foiled their plot. In her mind, James took his own life as a show of defiance rather than allow himself to be taken alive, but that couldn't be further from the truth. The sad irony is that James Gamble saved Halifax from a massacre that he himself planned out, and regardless of his questionable beliefs, he should be lauded for that. That might seem like a controversial opinion to some, but imagine for a moment that it was Lindsay who had possessed those firearms. Lindsay who remained remorseless when her evil plots were brought to light. Lindsay who claimed the only way she'd return to America was in a body bag. It was Valentine's Day, and we met in town for coffee. Afterwards, he suggested visiting an observatory, and I happily agreed going there. Little did I know, the observatory was over an hour bus ride out of town, and so by the time we had gotten there, the sun had started to set. Turned out we had to hike through the woods to get up that hill to reach the observatory. I was freezing in my summer dress, plus keep in mind that hiking in heels isn't fun at all. 
so while stumbling through the woods surrounded by nothing but darkness, I tried to at least keep up some nice conversation, which turned out impossible since the guy claimed to be busy talking to the trees and just gave me a cold stare every time I would try to say something. At that moment, I was convinced that some days later, somewhere in these woods, a hiker would find my cold, dead body. We reached the observatory at a time that I was on the verge of bursting into tears begging for my life for either trying to kill him in order to survive, and I was so happy that I saw another couple up there that I didn't even mind talking about all the UFOs that, believe it or not, he claimed to see. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. You should come join. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, this isn't even my final form.